cool so let's get started because we have a hard stop today so we want to make sure to okay the sharp ziblev is not actually referenced anywhere then that can the go what? the sharp ziblev ziblev is it, it, okay. it's already in the references but it was missing in the folder oh okay good Yes. That's it. Yeah, that's right. It's not. I need the to. Best uh, way. Ideally, we should use NuGet, but as a quick fix, I thought it would be. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, and and even better is to, um, in in other modules or in other modules, uh, modules singular, uh, like DMX, I um, uh, removed uh, Sharp Ziblip in the end and went with the native uh, .NET uh, compression. Yeah library which makes life a lot simpler yeah and it's safer too yeah okay so welcome to this 8th of november core module developers group meeting um <clears throat> i'm gonna go uh right on we're gonna skip the the validating next last week meeting notes and stuff because we have a hard stop so let's go directly into the subjects uh, a couple uh, updates. There's a new release of the feedback module uh, that has been published uh, about a week ago. Uh, it's mainly bug fixes. So there, it was not sending emails uh, with some combination of settings. If you had a specific combination, it was failing. Uh, that got fixed. And uh, in the database, the refer and user agent were reversed so i fixed that it's going to work on new installs and upgrades so that's available there's no major change other than that so it's pretty safe to use uh, there is also a new release of the site log module which was forgotten on our list of core modules for some reason and that that was still working other then if you install it new, there was no way to put the, the settings because before that was part of the core in that time. So there was an existing pull request that added the settings inside of the module instead of the core. And that single pull request closed like almost all the open issues. And uh, there was also a little problem logging the user information. Um, that's available right now to download. Um, I put this subject in the new items too, because I want to discuss a little bit uh, more on this module. Uh, in the things that are in progress, do we have any news on automated builds? I don't think so. Andrew's not with us. I know he was very busy. Anyone has anything on that? No? No real updates other than that Oliver is willing to <clears throat> help out with anything that we want to do if we want to do something. Um, I, I had uh, some time to look at, um, uh, to work on my uh, um, scripts for Cake again, um, I think last week or something. Um, what I'm running into is uh, just a couple, just a couple of things, but it's not really very well featured I find cake so you see you have to really make your own stuff a lot and um, I'm hesitating between two scenarios either I can code it all in C sharp wrap it into a DLL that you put into the uh, into your build folder right and say okay well the, where the script sits for cake um, or you're gonna have scripts that are basically C sharp scripts that do the same thing. And I hesitate a little bit between the two because the, uh, the advantage of having a DLL is that of course you're working in Visual Studio, you're compiling, you've got all your IntelliSense, um, you know, things work basically uh, as they do. Um, but uh, the advantage, of course, of scripts is that it's easier for um, someone who uses it. Let's say we have a boiler template kind of a module where we have those scripts, and it's easier for someone to kind of jump in and say, oh, no, I want to tweak this a little bit to my own taste. Yeah. So um, I, I think we need a discussion, um, and I think this is the best group to have it, actually, 
And um, we have a lot of different modules that come from different eras. Right. That have and totally different build processes. Exactly. Because often, um, uh, also, you know, you, you keep stuff in different places. Uh, I try to, uh, and, and, and I realize that the scripts that I make are, are heavily opinionated in how you would uh, piece something together, for instance, right? So um, I'm a big fan of the resources file, for instance. So I put everything into the resources file that I don't, that, that doesn't need to be announced to DNN. Uh, right, and it's just like okay. Well, the rest just goes into the resources spot, goes there, and everything else just sits in the root of the zip. And the manifest kind of takes care of putting that in the right place, yep. whether it's a DLL or a script or whatever. Um, but you know, some people think differently. They're like, no, 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 I want everything uh, you know listed out and, and and whatnot. So that requires a different type of script, um, and you know, you might want to have have an alternative to it so uh i i realize it's not always the um uh the way that other people other developers would um would see it although you know i'll stand happily defend of course my <laughs> my approach to it um i got so your back brother <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I like the resource files way too yeah exactly so so we, we, uh, resource files is just is, is is one thing so actually what i um at, at one point um where i left off uh, when i when i had to do other kind of real work again um it was um when i realized that actually what i wanted to do what i should do is put the um, a lot of the manifest into uh, in JSON in uh, in the package dot JSON. So my approach is this, right? I would like to kill the manifest file from um, from modules, if you like, from the from the developer. Take it out of the hands of the developer, right? So the the, the, the ideally in, in my world, the manifest is just generated. And there isn't even one to begin with in uh, in the whole thing. It's generated on the fly, is absolutely solid, etc. Will not break the installation when it goes into DNM. And um, uh, and and for most elements in your your build, this is really easy to do. Like the scripts, for instance. Well, if you have all your scripts in a folder, um, your build. A tool can just look at that folder, enumerate them, get the right version number out of it, and and you know create the right node and everything. Could do it for the assembly node, um, uh, etc. So what is left is things like the um, uh, the module definition. That although people other people say yeah, but you can pick that up from you know, and you could have it read the database so to speak on the project that you're working on. Mm -hmm. I like to kind of keep it under notes. So what I used to have, I used to have this dressed down um, uh, manifest in my modules, which just had that node actually sitting there, right? So the manifest was correct. And all I need, all the build process did was just add the nodes for assembly for scripts and that kind of stuff and set the version number correct. But it left the node intact that was the actual module definition. Right, so the module definition was something I did by hand. I said, but I could also do the same thing in JSON, which is actually a little bit more terse than uh, than XML, and it achieves the same goal because I'm already working with that package to JSON thing in my in my in my build script um, because that's, for instance, where the version number is. Right, the version number is the right at the top there. It says version that. And that is the number that will go into the um, uh, into the zip file name. It will go into the manifest. It will go into the DLLs, right, and the assembly info, yeah. and everything. Um, so yeah, I'm. Uh, that's that, where that I was headed. That's the one thing that changes every build. I mean, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, like, are you using separate version for? I'm sorry if I misunderstood what you're saying, but yeah. are you saying package? That JSON kind of version, yeah. Because no, we ran into this issue with like, there's a different version for that than there is for right. the module so my, version, right? <laughs> my okay. So my package JSON version is actually the version that determines the module version. 
Interesting. Yeah, so how you have, you have a version? Because we don't we don't do that package for package JSON. You have it on the assembly. What, you have it in the manifest. What's the, the use? Assembly. What's the use, David? Enlighten me. What's the use case for having different version numbers on your package to JSON when that package to JSON is part of your module? Well, they're two different things. Um, if I want to, because one's NPM based and the other one is module. Right. No, but, what's, what's, right? So, but tell me why is there need for a different version number? Why would you want to have a different version number? Can I come back to you on that? Because I know we do it. I just got to get my head back around why. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head. Come on, because we can. We ran into that where we had where there was a clear reason why those are different. I would. Okay. I would be. I'll be right back to you. Well, exactly, but because my um, like version numbers are your numbers that you communicate into the rest of the planet, and unless you're delivering two different things, yeah, then okay. But he's actually asking in real time, so maybe we'll get an answer on that. Maybe or maybe it's something else. But the right. the scientist answer to that question is because we can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was that was where he was going, and I was like, "Oh, yeah, you, no, 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 wait, you're not getting away that easy." <laughs> um, so yeah, so. But anyway, so so that's that's where I um, where I was heading right now, uh, and and the discussion I would like to have within this group is like, w what do you think? Should we keep it as as uh, dot cake scripts? Or should we, um, or should we go for a DLL uh, that you know we maintain somewhere some code for that? But are we talking for that to be something general of it's, tasks it's, that not available? Yeah, in, exactly. It's, in, uh, it's, in Cake, but that would be available for all kinds of multi-purpose things. Or are we talking about the specific build script? Those. Uh, the build scripts are a very specific cake, right? Mm -hmm. They're cake scripts. And if you talk about the DLL, it actually references cake as well because uh, there's no other way to do it. So it's very much tied to that build system. So if you have cake, you would have that DLL. But see that DLL as the same thing as we used to have, which is community build tasks, right? We yeah. we had that as well. Uh, but that was for MS build. So... Um, and I was never a fan, and, and I'll, I, so, so hence my hesitation of doing it as a DLL. I was never a fan of that because I didn't see what it was, right? It mm -hmm. was just a, a dot .dll that sat there. I couldn't just open it up. I know I could go to source code and whatnot and find out what was inside of it, but I still had to trust this DLL that sits in, you know, next to my precious code yeah. and does something. And if there's a surprise, I don't know why, why the surprise happened. Because what, what I was thinking was maybe to go some kind of hybrid to have a DLL that would be a, a NuGet package similar to the community tasks that would add whatever tasks yeah, that, we need that are not available in Cake. And then you well, actually have in code your specific build script. Yeah, but you can actually do everything with just scripts and not mm -hmm. a DLL. So you would avoid the NuGet uh, complexity there. Mm -hmm. Right, so you could just have the cake. All right, so Dave, tell me. Yeah, sorry, I I remember why it mattered to us, and it was really in the context of MV Quick Theme, where we've got a tool, and right. the version that's in package.json represents the version of the tool, whereas okay. it may build a theme that we want to publish a different version number of that theme without changing the version of the tool. So if you're using it in the module context and it's a one-to-one -one relationship, then mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It won't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Got it. Got it. All right. So anyway, that, that, uh, um, uh, indeed. So you, you could, um, right. That could all be tied together, uh, in that mechanism. So, Coming back to scripts versus DLL, um, if you you can almost one to one lift out the code from the DLL and into a script, and it will more or less work. You've got a it's really funky to set up um, references to the .NET framework, 
uh, that works a little bit different in cake. And sometimes I find it a bit counterintuitive because you've got a reference, a friggin path, hard path to, you know, see a uh, call on the backslash windows, backslash systems, backslash, you know, no net framework. And then, you know, go to the DLL of where that thing lives. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's really awful, right? Uh, it's not how we do stuff in a DLL where you just say this was built on .NET framework four, and it will figure out wherever those DLLs are. Yeah. I kind of prefer that. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. So I'm, I'm going to see how far I can push one or the other way. And, um, uh, uh, but yeah, the, the, the develop, you know, the development on this is very patchy. I really need, like it's it's really spare time this because there's so many other things to do, especially yeah, sure. in the DNN, uh, DNN zone. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah. Cool. So anyway, it's un- in progress. Yeah. Um, progress. Next uh, was the extension catalog. On the last meeting I wrote, we were postponing this due to the DNN hangout. Was there anything? Yeah, nothing really happened. I guess we can really remove this off of this agenda as far as I'm concerned. Because um, yeah, okay. uh, we did get some, you know, some feedback, but I was hoping to learn a little bit more about the usage for MV Quick Pulse. But it, it doesn't really seem to be there unless people are just not telling. Okay. So I'm not sure it's worth the investment. Cool. Uh, EPT is in vacation. Yeah, he was investigating a couple tools for automated uh, release notes. Uh, you guys have anything on that, or we just postpone it until he comes back? I think we postpone well, it until he, he comes back. Well, he provided the list. I think we were going to try to go back and look and find that list of uh, <laughs> tools that he had. Uh, I know I didn't do that. Uh, maybe somebody yeah. can take that because I think he's done what he was going to do. Uh, it was just a matter of, I think the things that I heard was people wanted to, the ability to modify whatever was auto-generated, you know. Um, but other than that, I don't know of any other requirements. So it's, it's probably just a matter of evaluating those tools and seeing which ones make sense. Yeah, for for me, well, I, I don't know what he wanted to to show on this or what's the the the, the good thing to use here. For me, it's more of a personal workflow. Every time I release a version, I go back to the development branch and I bump it for the next version and I generate already the everything for the release notes and everything but blank. And every time I make a change, the change includes the release note that goes with it. So it's all in the release notes file. Um, so. Yeah, I think this was more GitHub driven, what he was looking at, yeah. where it would automatically pull in any uh, pull requests that were that were merged between the la- the last version release, you know, follow commit, so you wouldn't have to reinvent that part of the wheel each time. Okay. Um, in the things in progress, um, well, it's a f- kind of in progress. I got a message from uh, Francisco Perez uh, about the vendors banners module. That one was also forgotten from the core modules, but that that was a module that got taken out of the the original uh, platform, and it's on the NN community uh, repository. Uh, basically, the need here it works, but uh, everything is fixed size, so it doesn't work nice on responsive sites. Um, I personally never use that module, so I'm not extra familiar with it, but also, I don't know where it, the, the, the standards are now. I know back then there was skyscraper and banner and square. There were very specific industry sizes for those types of banners. And they are kind of hard coded inside of the module. So I didn't hear back from Francisco, but I, I'll, I will open an RFC issue on that module to see what people want to go in the direction of this so that it still supports industry standards but is responsive. Um, so I'm going to open tonight an RFC on that and we can discuss it further. But basically, it's working, it's not failing, it's just not responsive. 
Um, and the new business, uh, Koi integration and core modules, that was Peter, I think? No, that's, no that was me. David? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I mean, we've talked about it a little bit here and there, but I was just curious if anybody believes that we should put any effort into incorporating this solution in any of the core modules. Uh, because, I, I, and the reason I bring it up is because, you know, I'd love to kind of help with some of the styling of mm -hmm. some of these modules to kind of bring them a little more current. And one way to be framework agnostic or not fully agnostic, but pretty framework agnostic is to use this solution. But um, I have a few concerns about it, I guess. Uh, just curious if we could have a dialogue about that and come to consensus on whether or not it's good. My opinion on Koi, uh, there's no easy way to detect if, uh, without Koi, I mean, to detect what the skin is using, Bootstrap 3, Bootstrap 4, other stuff, you know. And when I do a model for a very specific client who's not going to change his skin, it saves time to use Bootstrap classes because, you know, it's there, the buttons and stuff, it's nice. For something that's going to be distributed widely, like a module that is everybody can use, then it's a bit more complicated because you don't know what the skin has. So Koi is nice because it solves that problem. It can detect if well detect it can detect if the skin supports it, if it's using Bootstrap three or four or no Bootstrap or others, and it's extensible for that. So it's nice. However, uh, what I fail. It. It can detect it or if the, skin... if the theme has core. Exactly, yeah, if the skin the reports it. Yeah. yeah. So um, I don't know if the big modules, uh, skin vendors integrated Koi in their updates or if they just didn't care about it. So I, I don't know how many people will have skins that have Koi. And one thing I, I kind of don't get the point of Koi is that if you detect if it's bootstrap three or four or no bootstrap, then you can style for no bootstrap or bootstrap three or bootstrap four. So you have to do the job three times. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea is that you become um, more flexible as a module um, and, and it, it is more code for sure. Yeah but it will adapt to whatever the skin is, uh, is emitting, but it depends on the skin. And I, I've, um, I think, I think this is a rabbit hole we've all been down to is that we make something that depends on a, a group of, you know, other, uh, uh, vendors playing along. And then you realize that actually this is not going to go anywhere because no one really cares that you've done this this way. And, um, uh, they don't necessarily uh, agree. Be mu it'd be much nicer if the the actual core framework had a um, I don't know a, a set of known settings for this kind of thing in the uh, client dependency framework, right? So so I made some adjustments to the client dependency framework in this direction where I was hoping that might one day become that which is uh that even a you know the, the client dependency framework is basically manages what gets sent out over the wire so it is the place to have things communicate with each other like hey what is it what's going on right you could interrogate the client dependency framework and say did you do you have bootstrap 3 listed yeah what version of jquery are you loading what, what and stuff of jquery yeah, exactly nice Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, given that we are supposed to actually use the client dependency framework to emit our stuff, because otherwise it will never be able to be bundled by, by mm -hmm. DNN, um, and I'm assuming that everyone plays along with that, that is yeah. still the best place to actually, you know, probe and, and, and interfere with these things. But, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of approaches. We could just state which frameworks were you know, supporting in the module right. release time. I mean, I, I, that's where I'm kind of leaning towards because they've already changed the model once. Right. And that's what I think you're alluding to. It's like we're now depending on somebody else's opinion of how this, you know, needs to, needs to work. And if that changes, then it has a, you know, a negative right. effect. 
to I, th I think we can learn from some of the things that are done in Koi. I think there's an in some interesting stuff in there, definitely. And I, I, I definitely appreciate the effort that Daniel uh, made to, to make something like this. Um, we're, we're talking uh, Daniel Mettler. M Mettler, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, not um, Falaras, I think he's called. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> loads of Daniels actually in our community but anyway so so um, yeah Mettler's a, a solution so uh, you, you know I, I think we could actually uh, pick some of the best ideas from it and, um, and maybe come up with an even better uh, solution for, for yeah. this stuff. so in the but, meantime do you have any preferences on how the how we should my, proceed with uh, UI updates on the module? My, op my opinion is that it should be uh, relying on the less stuff possible. So using just like CSS3 uh, uh, grid system or uh, Flexbox, you know, very, very standard that it works. And if we want to extend that to be nicer looking on Bootstrap and or this and that, and, and we have the time for, cool. Now we have to keep in mind also not to invest too much time on UI, mm -hmm. knowing that we're gonna have to change the UI on all these. Uh, exactly. Yeah, but How? the CSS framework won't really change. Yeah, yeah but uh, the controls probably gonna be different and yeah, stuff. Controls, so, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not something we should be putting too much time until each of these modules, well, module per module, it's converted either to MVC or an SPA. Uh, pattern because uh, web forms going to go away at some point. So, well, I mean, should we put any, any effort towards converting all these controls to web components? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of already yeah. started doing that. I've already got a label control for it, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's about just, doing some of the other ones. Just a bit of a moving target, but any move that we make away from web forms would be a good move. Can Dave? Can you, uh, David? Can you can you make a, a presentation um, on a meeting like this one, once on just yeah, sure. purely purely that, just yeah. uh, demo what the web controls look would look like in the future, and did, how a module um, would use it. Yeah, absolutely. You're the one who presented web controls on the Southern Fried meeting, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that, All right. that, that was I'm presenting out a data summit as well. So, so for now, I would leave the Koi integration um, as, as I think it opens up uh, a larger discussion that also uh, concerns the framework itself. Mm. The, on, the only thing uh, maybe we would have to check how it would work for controls that, that need to communicate with the DNN API directly, let's say an upload control, uh, date picker where you would need to have the user time zone and stuff. How would that be packaged to be reusable? Yeah, go, go look at the React components and you'll see how it looks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's ugly. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, that is a great question because that's really where the problem comes in. Is so you, you're going to need an API in the mm. core for image upload that is made for that control, right? that the control can access and use without having to build that in the actual component itself. In other words, that the end developer using the component does everything that it needs to do to access that. So that's really how you have to do it. You have to offload the power or the feature of the component itself and put that into the developer's hand that's implementing it and just give them the flexibility to do what they need to do. So it's just wow. like kind of going out and getting a, a jQuery uh, plugin that now you want to do upload into DNN. Well, you have to wire that up yourself, right? So, okay. or in a bigger scale, you take the CK editor, right? You mm. gotta have a provider. So that's the implementation of a JavaScript base uh, editor, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and yeah, it's kind of a moving target because I know we have a ton of React components available to us and those can be used outside of the persona bar, but they're React. They're not independent as uh, web components don't, don't, don't depend on anything, right? 
That is correct, mm. which is the power of it. Well, they depend on the, the features of the browser. And now that we have native support with Firefox as well, there are no browsers right now that can't support the things that we would be using in web components natively without mm. polyfills. And the polyfills will still be there for the old browsers. That's correct. Mm. Yeah, for the older versions. So that would be a project to that would be separate from DNN, that would be a, a NuGet package people can use, or would that be something we need to integrate into the core? No, right now I'm doing it under MV Quick Components, but there's no reason that couldn't be. It's being published under NPM, not oh. as NuGet, but with NPM. Okay. Andrew Heffling's working with me a little bit on that, but we, we kind of got to a whole pattern a bit before we jumped in too much we just want to kind of because we right now it's configured all as a collection so it's you get the entire collection regardless of what component you want so i think we're talking about separating those out into individual components that can be uh consumed via npm okay so for koi integration so basically we need a base style that doesn't rely on any framework and on top of that, we can extend it if we want to make it look nicer. If we, if Koi is there, it's something we can do. There's nothing special to, 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 to integrate other than using Koi, right? There's no decision to be made here. Um, I think I missed your point there. Because <laughs> I, put, I put, right. <laughs> okay, in the agenda, I put in the new business the the stuff that we just started talking about. And if there's an action item, if there's something to do, I put it on the unfinished business. And when it's completed, I put it finished. Now this thing here, it's pretty much finished. There's no there's All no right. action item to do on our part. People can use it if they want. That's the thing, right? Well, I guess the question is. Like if I wanted to contribute or anybody else wanted to contribute to help the UI, are we saying, okay, yes, you can do Koi? Or are we saying, no, only use CSS3 and, you know, Flexbox and, and CSS Grid or whatever? Or are we saying, no, nope, you can use Bootstrap 4, you can do whatever you want to? Yeah, that, that's what I was meaning here, that we need we need the base that doesn't rely on anything because we don't know what if the skin even reports, uh, if the skin uses Koi or stuff. So there's no way we can be sure that there is any framework. So we still need a base that works without anything. And if we want to improve upon that, it's open for people to do it. Okay. But there's no action on our part to say use Koi, don't use Koi. But I'm if you want to use Koi, go ahead and add it, right? Make sense? Okay. Yeah, sure. I was just curious if we were going to try to standardize on a particular styling direction. Uh, well, if I mean, because if one module uses Koi and the other one uses Bootstrap four and the other one uses Material, but you know. <laughs> but 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 a module could not use Bootstrap four directly inside of the module because it would break on the skin if the skin is using Bootstrap three, or that, it would have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for I mean, you, we kind of need a a direction because like you, we run into this all the time. You know, module developers have yeah. an opinionated you know way of the doing styling, and then the theme does something different, and then or does the same thing, but they're loading two different versions of the framework. So now they're not being handled properly by CDF. And I mean, just all kinds of issues. So mm -hmm. just curious as to what our direction is. I, I don't think we're going to be able to pull the trigger on that in, in this um, small meeting. Yeah. Uh, okay. So but, maybe but it's it's pretty, but I I think we should bring it up again. Uh, yeah. Okay. But my my point was that even if we decide, okay, let's go a Bootstrap four and stuff, we still need a base style in case it's not there. Right. N not if that is the standard we're choosing. But you would load Bootstrap four with the module. 
Exactly, which is not a great practice, but and we what could, we the could skin do is it. using Bootstrap tree. You would namespace it, or yeah, you could namespace it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's different things, but then it then that's a performance hit because you're loading multiple <laughs> versions of the same framework, and yeah, yeah, it's. I know it's a bigger conversation. I don't mean to open okay. up worms, okay. but I'm just thinking. I would love to one, you know, contribute to helping these modules look a little bit more modern, and yeah. I don't want to waste time doing it. I'd like to know kind of what we agree is the right path forward. Yeah. Not a clear cut answer either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it fires up uh, a couple other concerns because very often if you're going to be using mainly Bootstrap 4, there's color classes that you can set your primary, secondary. That's very, very useful because if you have your brand colors there, then you have one place you change it and it affects everything. So if the module could reuse that, it would have whatever company branding colors for the buttons and stuff. But exactly. that, that would need Koi. So it uses the, the built-in one in the skin and not the one with the module. And we could load conditionally the the namespaced one on the module depending if the skin already has it or not, right? Mm, that's correct. Okay. So I get more now your point. Okay, so I'm gonna put to be continued so we continue this discussion. Uh, as I said before, the, the site log module, okay, I, I made a small, um, uh, but whatever, I don't need to show that. I made a small um, fix so that now we have a UI to do the settings and everything. Now, is that still relevant today with Google Analytics and stuff, or there would really be no use? Because I, if people would like that, this could, be not too bad to re-implement as a persona bar module. But this is, isn't but this the, uh, um, the, the old admin yeah. module? Well, this is the old one that tracks all the stuff that now everybody uses Google Analytics or Clicky or some other platform to. Oh, okay. To, to so manage. yeah, that, that's the one that the got turned off by default, I think yeah. way back in version four. So, yeah, because of performance. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think uh, that that's something we need to continue developing, no, right? Same as the uh, users online, right? That was uh... yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, we personally haven't used it since it went away, um, and we didn't even use it much before then. And what by we, I mean any of our clients. But the, I do know there are some people that still use this uh, for internal reporting purposes. I don't know why, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to put an RFC, see what people think on this. If we see there's no replies, we can consider it's pretty much abandoned and leave it the way it is. If we see there's interest, that, that would be a nice uh, module candidate for the first core module that's going to be a persona bar module. <laughs> Okay, security uh, analyzer. What is that? Oh, dismiss. Do we have a few uh, hours to talk about this one? <laughs> uh, no, just a really quick update. The security analyzer. Uh, basically, there's the old one that was a web forms module that was released by the community for the NN7 and up or 6 and up, don't remember. And um, now there's a new one that's built into the core and is a persona bar extension. Uh, the old one, if you have it installed, uh, will do will analyze your things and say you're safe, where you're not really safe because that was when that was not updated. And to be safe, you need to be on nine two and up now. So there was a minimal change, uh, kind of a last update to kill that module uh, that will mention uh, that there there's known vulnerabilities and you need to upgrade to the NN92 and uninstall this module because it's now integrated in the core uh, and that's going to close this module. There was like 20 something open issues on the old one 
Uh, some of them were already fixed, just forgotten to be closed. Uh, some of them I moved into the correct repository and uh, it's all cleaned up. So this module will, in the next days, get a new release and be closed. Thank you Thanks. for all those notifications this morning. Good. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's a cleanup. So if you're looking for your issue on this one, it's either closed because there was a reason I put comments on everything or it's moved into the uh, admin experience. So it's gonna be on the GitHub uh, DNN software and yeah, on the admin yeah. experience. And it's all the top issues that start with security analyzer. Yeah. So these things here. So that's more of a clean up and to close the old one. Um, this place, uh, oh. There we go. Um, we've been working a little on the blog module. Um, I closed maybe 10 or 12 issues that were either duplicates or just a question and stuff. And I tagged all of the other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just talking, uh, me and Peter, uh, I have two pull re Oh, he already merged them in. So there you go. Awesome. So the build process is fixed. Now you can clone and build and everything is good to go. And all the issues have been tagged with either a bug or an enhancement, or uh, if it needs more details, there's a waiting for reply. Some of them could not reproduce and stuff. So the, the issues are cleaned up. And I put all the bugs into a 642 milestone. So yeah. during the next one or two weeks, I'm gonna be sending uh, pull requests on all the bugs. I'm gonna leave the enhancements aside unless Perfect. I'm working on something. So uh, now that you're working on it and you're a bit familiar with the code, um, yeah. maybe you know a, a small moment to discuss like the future direction of this module. Um, now, as you can see, I've um, I've uh, uh, built a templating system into it that is based off of the DNN's token replace uh, templating system, uh, but I enhanced it somewhat so you get custom tags that do intelligent things like repeat things, yep. for instance, or do an if then kind of thing. So that kind of made the templating system a bit richer and able to do this. Now, um, there's a, you know, the very valid question you could have is like, Peter, why didn't you just do this in Razor? Well, actually, um, this was done before the whole MVC pattern and before Razor became a thing in DNN. So I was kind of stuck with the technology of the day. Yep. Um, now, obviously, you're looking at it going like, wow, that could actually be done a lot better in Razor because then I can unleash all of my c sharp right into the page and, and do whatever I want. So the, the, the question is... Um, uh, do we, you know, I, I don't feel we should enhance the, the old templating system anymore. I think, you know, that's kind of like it, it served its purpose. Um, but I think it warrants a, uh, uh, if, if, if something is going to be added to it, I think it would be done in a, uh, in a new templating system that uses Razor, which, which is just awesome for it. Yes. For this kind of thing. Um, so that's one thing, one thought about but, but it. But we don't have to remove the existing one, though. No, 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 no. You would, you would, you know, of course, people are, you know, they, they have something up and running, so, so mm -hmm. you don't want to annoy them. Uh, it's just that they're not going to get new features into it, right? So, so they're basically, you know, if it works, it works, and mm -hmm. that's it. Um, and then uh, the other thought is um, I made a push. I didn't publicize this a lot, but um, uh, to me, these kind of templates uh, could be part of skins. So the module actually looks first in, uh, it has uh, so-called system templates. They, they are the ones that come with the module. So they're in the desktop module slash blog slash resources slash yep. new templates folder. 
Um, but then it looks in there under your skin folder uh, slash blog slash template, something like that. And it will call those skin templates, mm -hmm. right? So that would allow a skin developer to roll out a package that actually contains the complete blog module template that would be necessary to make it look good. Yep. And um, I've always felt that that would, that should be the way that we should go about making core modules look good in the future. And, uh, and now with razor files, you know, they're, they're going to survive for a while anyway. And you could just, you know, load the razor file, put your object in there and boom, you know, off to the screen. Um, so, so maybe actually this, this would jump into the, um, into the Koi discussion as well and say, you know what, um, we're going to offer like basic templates that render basic content, et cetera, but we'll have some documentation about how you can style this and roll it into your skin so that a skin uh, provider can say, well, you know, my skin actually supports these and these and these core modules. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and on a third level, it would look into the portal. Right. At the third level, it, you, you can have your own skins. You can say um, in, in, the, in the whole template management system, it says if you want to change it, you obviously can't change directly a system skin, a uh, mm -hmm. template, or a skin, uh, I think, a template either, because that would affect everyone, right? Yep. So what it does is say, okay, well, then you copy that into your portal and you give it a name of some sort that you want to, and then you can edit it there. And that sits under, you know, your portal folder slash blog slash templates. Um, and, and so you have those three levels of templating uh, that, that you can use. And um, I, I think um, it is something we could... Uh, put our weight behind and I, first of all, you know, make the show other people how the blog module does that um, and maybe attack another module and try to do the very same thing. That is a fantastic idea. Thank you, David. That made my uh, day. I would be in full support of that because, I mean, it's so frustrating and it's not yeah. anybody's fault. It's just the way it is. It's just everybody has their own way and it's like to really style a site really depends on the solution that you put in place. And then exactly. yeah. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, and, and, I, I don't and, know how many commercial vendors would really adopt this, but if it was well, well I, for, done, take, like, yeah, exactly. It makes take, sense. The open source um, skin skins of our good friend, um, Jeff Barlow, uh, yeah. uh, Jeff Barlow. Um, if he would roll a blog template into it, um, that would be complete control over how the whole thing would be rendered. There would be no surprises. And that's the right place for it to live. As well. And that's exactly, it's the right place for it to live. Yep. All styling in one place. And so I, uh, you know, given that that's an open source one, probably there is some, um, motivation for people to actually add the blog template that would look good. Well, if we could figure out a way uh, with ME Quick Things, a lot of people are using that to build themes these days. So exactly. we yep. could we could build in some uh, commands, for instance, to pull in various extension template, you know, that yeah. uh, could include. All right. Well, let's let's cool. let's uh, let's um, move on that idea. Awesome. So that's pretty much it for this week. Uh, yeah, we have six minutes. I need to... Uh, Good timing. Good yeah. to... So, grab something to drink before the next meeting as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So, I'll see you soon in the next meeting. And uh, thanks for attending. And see you in... Uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, thanks to you, Daniel, for, uh, for the work you've done, especially also for the blog module. Thank Great. you. It's a pleasure. It's good yeah. to hear from you too, Joe. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll, I'll, I'll try not to be as chatty next time. <laughs> All right. He's, he's like, what shall I, what shall I choose? Shall I choose NPR radio or switch this off? Okay, let's switch this off. Uh, this, this is certainly better than all of the political talk I've heard. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay, we'll try. We'll try to make it more heated then next time. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to argue some more next time. <laughs> bye. All right, bye, John. Okay, see you soon. See you later. Thanks, Daniel. No problem.